And I am very excited to present our speaker today, who is Captain Donna Morrow, who um, does very interesting works for the state of Maryland. She's the program manager for the Maryland Clean Boater Program. As a part of that, she's also the director of the Office of Marine and Coastal Stewardship, which as we know, our oceans and the Chesapeake are just getting dirtier and dirtier. And by the year 2050, it's expected that we'll have more plastic and debris in the ocean than fish. So it is um, such a pleasure to have uh, Captain Morrow sort of talk us through some of these programs. And uh, let me tell you more about those. So we also have, uh, she oversees the Maryland Clean Marina Initiative and the Maryland Clean Vessel Act, which provides funding for marine pump out stations. And she also has participated in the Mid-Atlanta Regional Council, which um, has a group that works on oceans marine debris and a working group for the oceans marine debris. So uh, these are all, I don't know if other people have questions about these groups. I know we all know there's initiatives out there, but how do we participate? What do they do? And even, you know, why, why should we care? And I think, Kat Morrow is going to be able to tackle all those questions for us now, and I'm so glad everybody's here to, to listen and for us to kind of get reinvigorated for this new sailing season and do what we can, do our part, encourage others to do their part, encourage the marinas that we're in to do their part to help start making a difference in a cleaner water experience for us all, which I think we all, no matter if you're a fisherman or a sailor or whatever it is you do on the water, we're all gonna benefit from a cleaner place. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Captain Mara. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Yvonne. Can you hear me okay? Are you great? Okay, great. Always do my little radio check there, you know, make sure you can hear me okay. All right, well, thank you all very much for uh, tuning in this evening and uh, paying attention to this topic, which is of course near and dear to my heart. Um, is sort of the environmental impacts of boating. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which means I may not be able to see you while I'm talking, but um, I know somebody will track any questions that we have and um, get them to me. So let me go ahead and do that. I think that's the right thing. Okay. Okay, are we, are we good? Got it? All right, great. Um, I, as Yvonne mentioned, oversee quite a few little environmental programs that have to do with boating or touch in some way on boating. Um, so I'm going to give you sort of a, a shotgun approach to a little bit of everything here. And I'm sure that you'll have some questions that will be specific, um, but we'll try to dive in here. Um, and I always start to put things in context that I, I never come at this thinking that recreational boating or even commercial, um, well, some commercial boating, but recreational boating is certainly not a major source of pollution in the world, but it is one and it does have some impacts, but it's certainly not the biggest thing that we face. Um, uh, but they do have impacts primarily um, from fuel and oil uh, are a big risk. Cleaning and maintenance, all the boats that we take care of have to be maintained and painted and washed and all that. And um, we all generate a lot of waste, right? Wherever we go, we have something to eat or drink or gear that we bring. So we've got waste to deal with. And um, there's vessel sewage, of course. All of those four big areas can have some impact um, on, in the, on our natural environment. Um, and so we'll talk about ways we can minimize those impacts today. Um, the first section I'll touch on here is fuel and oil, um, and I just generally say petroleum, so whatever form it may take on your boat. Um, certainly there is, um, when you have a fuel spill, if there's a fuel spill, be it large or small, um, it has significant impacts on our marine life. First of all, it will reduce the penetration of any light getting through the water. Um, and exchange, prevents any oxygen exchange at the surface of the water. Um, and it contaminates what we call the microlayer. And the microlayer is really that uppermost portion of the water column, um, the top little layer, and it's home to thousands of species of plants, animals, and microbes. Um, in fact, 99% of the Chesapeake Bay's blue crab larva feed in that 
uh, micro layer, which also serves as a micro, as sort of a nursery ground for striped bass and other uh, prominent species that people enjoy. And because there's a lot of active uh, uh, life in that micro layer, it also attracts predators, um, seabirds and fish feed on that. So any pollution in that micro layer really has the potential to, to poison a lot of our aquatic food web. So fuel spills, that's sort of the environmental reason why they are especially bad. Um, and there are of course laws surrounding this as you are well aware, but the Federal Water, Water Pollution Control Act um, prohibits discharge um, of anything that would cause a film or a sheen on the water or any discoloration um, uh, on the surface of the water or anything that would cause a sludge or emulsion below the surface of the water. Um, and any violators are subject to a fine from the US Coast Guard up to $5,000 for that spill. Now the state of Maryland also has additional laws on the books that replicate this and they can impose um, additional fines. Uh, if you uh, are responsible for a significant spill. So if you were to have a spill, a lot of people wonder what they should do. Uh, again, we're talking about a minor spill from one boat. Um, so a lot, in the old days, everybody used to say, oh, just spray a little Dawn on it or put a little soap on there. Um, but that is really not a good idea. Um, that soap, what it actually does, it's a, co a coagulant and it will bond all the petroleum molecules together and it sinks it, it's a sinking agent and it just drops it to the bottom of the creek, which is nice because suddenly we don't see it anymore and we think we've done a good thing, but really it just hangs out at the bottom. And at the bottom, we have a lot of life too. That's really important. Our worms or mussels or things that are also part of the food web. Um, so, in fact, the penalty for using that kind of thing to hide a spill, or, or they consider it hiding a crime, is even higher than the five thousand for the for the spill in the first place. They can fine you up to twenty five thousand dollars for um, using a dispersant like that to hide a crime. Um, instead, we would certainly prefer you would use some sort of an oil absorbent pad uh, on that small spill. I keep plenty of these on my boat. Um, just for little minor things that happen here and there. Uh, and a boat hook, you can use that to sort of push the pad around and mop up what you may have spilled. Um, letting it evaporate is really not a bad thing either in most cases with a small spill, um, primarily if that's diesel. If, it, if we've got a gasoline situation, it's more flammable, um, but most important, we wanna report that um, any significant spill to the Coast Guard spill response line, which is listed there. So uh, some practices um, for preventing spills at the first place um, is uh, keeping in mind that fuel comes from underground tanks very often, not always, but very often your fuel is coming from an underground tank that's significantly colder than it is on a hot boat on a hot day. So when that fuel comes rushing in, it's, you need to leave room for expansion in your tank as it heats up. So we say don't fill it more than 90% capacity. Um, a lot of recreational boaters sadly do not even know what the capacity of their tank is or how much fuel they're taking on that day or anything. So uh, I, I definitely feel like you are a more educated group about these sorts of things and probably know your boat much better. But uh, we also, of course, we recommend that you fill up as you head out on your trip instead of on your way in, because then you're going to burn that fuel down. Um, fueling portable tanks ashore is another good tip because you'll, um, if you have any drips or spills, it's easier to contain it. You can put it in a little container or on a mat. Um, and of course, be mindful, never do anything unattended, uh, which is actually not permitted uh, by fire prevention code. You should not have unattended fueling at a marine fuel dock. Like you might be allowed to do it on land, but not a, a marina fuel dock. So, you know, there's times I've seen it happen, you know, when people are hot and tired and they want to go in the dock shop and get an ice cream or something and they stick a Coke can in the fuel nozzle and walk away. Um, that is definitely not a smart fueling practice. Um, and what we see in this picture here at the bottom, I've circled, there's a little no spill jug. You may have heard of these. That's a brand of uh, spill capture device that um, can go on the outside of the boat. Um, if your fuel vent is prone to burping out a little bit of fuel, these little spill capture cups uh, are made by Davis 
I think, and um, are commonly available. And they're not very expensive, but that's one tip. And of course, always maybe wrapping a little piece of oil absorbent towel with you with the nozzle back and forth, all that kind of helps prevent spills in the first place. Okay, so main, maintaining and cleaning these boats. Um, since not they, they don't all use a lot of fuel, of course, they're sailboats and kayaks and things, but they all need their maintenance. So what could some of the harm be there? Um, certainly detergents, right? If you've ever washed your boat and the water looked like you see here on this picture, that's really not great. We don't wanna see a lot of foamy, sudsy stuff in the water lingering. Um, harsh detergents can really destroy the natural oils that are on fish gills and limits their ability to breathe. Um, certainly any sort of nasty chemical contamination um, from like stain removers, FSR, um, Mary Kate on and off, some of these really strong caustic cleaners should never be used and allowed to go back directly into the waterway. Those are um, very harmful. And then um, as we sand and maintain our boats, um, there are you know, debris, microplastics, and sanding debris that can be released. So some of the best practices that we recommend for boaters um, is not running, you know, not washing everything off over the side of the boat in the first place. Rinse it with fresh water and use a little elbow grease. Avoid those soaps if you can. Uh, soaking is a good thing. It does it wonders. Um, spot cleaning, there are some stains or scuff marks that are just not going to come up with, you know, water and a scrub brush. So fine, use your stronger uh, cleaner there, but just spray it on and then wipe it off. Don't hose it overboard. Keep a rinse bucket and then dump that in the uh, sink ashore if you can. Um, likewise, waxing your boat, uh, the hull, the uh, top sides of the boat will help prevent stains getting set in in the first place. And we'll talk a little bit about cleaners because um, a lot of times people mean well and they go to the store and they say, oh, I wanna get the, the environmentally friendly cleaner, um, but I caution you about a thing we, we environmentalists call uh, greenwashing, which means you know they're kind of greenwashing you into buying the product and making you think it's really good, but maybe it's really not any different than something else. So I encourage you to really read product labels. Um, we uh, often recommend that you use things that are non-toxic um, and biodegradable and phosphate free. Those three things. Uh, phosphates are pretty much banned in Maryland anyway, but the non-toxic is important and biodegradable, all three of those things. Um, as I say, beware of any sort of general environmental claim that says, you know, we're the greenest, we're the best, or it just has a green label. These two um, logos I have here on the slide are helpful. I, I feel like Green Seal is a very good one. Uh, that's an independent certification that they, uh, a product has to apply for and that's independently tested. So you know that it really is doing what it says it will do on the label. And likewise, EPA has a similar label designed for the environment. So those are two tips that I always recommend to people. But bottom line is, you know, don't go out to the store. And the one that, that really is my least favorite is when I see somebody using like soft scrub with bleach uh, and then just hosing that right off the deck. Uh, it's a great cleaner, it really is. But bleach is really toxic and shouldn't just go straight overboard. So, and then the last thing I have mentioned on here is, of course, follow the rules of your marina or boat yard um, if you keep your boat somewhere like that. Um, so when it comes to that sort of the cleaning of the boat, the maintenance of the boat's another ball of wax. Um, always would recommend that you're using uh, vacuum equipment like you see in the picture here. If you're gonna do any um, grinding or sanding and hull preparation for, for bottom paint. Um, and of course, you can recycle a lot of things that come off a boat. Of course, oil and antifreeze can be recycled. A lot of marinas will collect that, but if yours doesn't, um, there are places that are free and publicly available. Most um, county land, uh, landfills and uh, transfer stations take that. Um, the Maryland Environmental Service also has a free um, list, has a listing of free public collection tanks on their website. Um, but zincs, batteries, all of these things can be and should be recycled. 
Um, now, hazardous materials that come off of your boat, a lot of times we buy something for a job and we have a good bit of it left over and we're not going to use it. Say it's varnish or something and you're done. You're not going to be revarnishing for another year or two. And that product is probably going to go bad and not be so good in a year or two. Um, I always encourage people just to, to pass it on, donate it, give it to somebody else, get it used up. That's the best way to do that rather than, you know, end up stockpiling. I know we all end up with a shed or, you know, a bit, you know, storage areas just full of half full cans and containers and paints and who knows what. So um, if, you, if you're not going to use it all up and, and obviously try to buy smaller uh, quantities, if, if you don't need more, don't buy it. So that's uh, with the hazardous stuff. And um, when you, if you do have bad gasoline, uh, that's a, a very tricky one to get rid of. Um, I, I'm often asked about that. Um, your, some boatyards and marinas will take it for you and dispose of it for you, but never leave a mystery container at your boatyard and just hope they'll figure out what's in it and what to do with it. That's like the most annoying thing that I hear from the boatyards and marinas I work with is that they just come in the next day and find these jerry jugs that they, they don't even know what's in it. So they have to pay the highest possible cost to get rid of it. So um, if you're a resident of Anne Arundel County or any almost any county in Maryland, they have household hazardous waste days and you can take a small quantity of fuel um, to them to handle it for you at no cost. And that's what I would recommend you do is find your county hazardous waste days. Um, last thing on this slide is uh, on the bottom, there is a picture of a boat with a reusable cover, and that's our slogan is think before you shrink. Um, thousands and thousands of boats choose to get shrink wrap every winter, which is a great thing for protection of the boat, um, but either try to find a way to reuse that wrap, um, do something else with it. Um, but don't just, uh, you know, if you, if you don't really need it, don't buy it in the first place. Look at a reusable cover. Um, that's just one little side mention there. Okay. What else? So bottom painting, that's something most of us have to do or have done. And I'm often asked about what type of bottom paint should I get? Which is the best one? Which is the most eco-friendly? And there's really no one answer for that. Um, you really have to know how you're gonna use your boat. Um, first of all, where are you gonna keep it? Um, if you're here in the Mid-Atlantic, you really don't need the strongest stuff they make for down in the tropics or the Keys or anything like that. They make some real high test stuff for places that have much higher anti or much higher rate of fouling than we do. I wouldn't get the one that's appropriate for Mid-Atlantic. Um, the vessel use, um, how are you using this boat? Um, if you are only going out once a month, the boat's not getting used very much. It's sitting in the slip a lot, um, as opposed to say a commercial boat that's running every day on and on. And then the speed of that boat, is it a sailboat? Does it just go at four or five, six knots uh, through the water? In that case, you're not gonna want an ablative paint. Ablative paints work best if there's constant sloughing action and the boat's running through the water a lot. Uh, and the maintenance of the boat. How much time do you have and how often do you want to repaint that bottom? So having said all that, um, generally speaking, there's like three categories of bottom paint. Uh, ablative or soft paints, they wear away like a bar of soap and they're always revealing um, fresh antifoulant underneath of it. Um, those can last more than one season. Then you have your hard antifouling paints um, that are applied every year. And you need to do some pretty aggressive sanding in between. Um, and if not, those layers will build up and sooner or later, you're gonna to need to get it blasted off or stripped off. Um, and then the third category would be sort of the hard coatings that don't have any biocide in them. They're very slick, you know, like a silicone thing that you might put on a race boat uh, bottom. Um, so what's good for one boat isn't really good for another. You need to think about all of these types of things when you pick your boat or pick your, your bottom paint. Um, there are, you know, I always say talk to your service department if you're getting it done professionally. They are very knowledgeable usually about the latest products. Um, there are some water-based products out now that have um, fewer air emissions, VOCs, um, but that may not necessarily be the right paint for you. So um, moving on to 
underwater hull cleaning. Since we touched on bottom paint, a lot of times that leads to a discussion about, can I clean this in the water? And that's another question you should ask yourself before you select a paint. Um, if you want to have that bottom washed down or wiped down by a diver every week for racing, you shouldn't be using a blade of paint. All you're doing is wasting your money and it's taking paint off every time that diver would go down and wipe the bank down, right? It's supposed to wear away through natural moving through the water, but not aggressively going and scrubbing it off. That doesn't say that kind of wastes your money and, and, and uh, it's just not very good. And it's also uh, violates the law in the sense that you're not supposed to remove paint in the water. So, um, never clean ablatives in the water. And the other thing I would say is, is obey the rules at your marina. Um, there's always a risk of electrocution when somebody goes in the water and there's live current nearby, it's very dangerous and many of them will not allow you to have a diver. Um, some people want to take their own boat and you know run it aground on a sandbar, wait till the tide goes out and wash it down. That's your prerogative. That's also pretty dangerous, but um, Best thing is having it hauled out, washed off ashore, but. Okay, moving on. So that was sort of a big section. Um, the waste containment and disposal section, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things I think Yvonne alluded to at the beginning, which was, um, you know, the impacts to the environment on trash that we can leave behind and marine debris in general. Um, this picture, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but this is an osprey nest and that osprey nest is full of balloons and ribbons and plastic and all kinds of junk. Um, and this is, sadly, it's not very uncommon. Um, you know, this environment, our environment is littered with plastics everywhere. Um, and this graphic on the right is, I think, very good. Um, it just sort of boils down uh, the deadliest trash that we find out there. So if you have, you know, if you're an angler and you have fishing line or schools or anything, you know, always wrap those up and take them carefully home with you and throw them in the trash. Cigarette butts, never be flicking those overboard. I know a lot of people, well, not a lot, uh, but people often assume that cigarette butts are made of plastic or paper or cardboard or something and that they're biodegradable and it's sort of the last acceptable means of littering, uh, but it's it's not okay. They are made of fiberglass and, and some sort of little plastic in there, mostly fiberglass. So uh, animals mistake those for food and ingest them. And whether they ingest something and die as a result of starving because they can't get nutrients, their belly is now full of debris, or they get entangled in something like fishing line and then are, as a result, they suffer and, and may die. None of these are good. So it sort of goes without saying, but um, some of the impacts to us, right? Um, hey, nobody wants to have their trip end like this with a bunch of fishing line or an old fishing net wrapped around your crop. That's certainly a, a bad day on the water. Um, likewise, you know, uh, abandoned crab pot or anything that could that could uh, come into contact is, is not fun. Um, and plastic bags or debris, balloons, anything like that can uh, certainly uh, foul an intake, a, a raw water intake where you can't cool that engine and you're going to have a bad day. So um, in their infinite wisdom, somebody already addressed this. Congress passed, uh, as I'm sure many of you captains know, MARPOL, as we call it, that, um, whoops, sorry, go back, there we go. Uh, the MARPOL Pollution Act uh, restricts where you can dump anything in the waters of the US. Um, and I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but I would imagine you're familiar with this. I think what it's important to note is that, you know, the further you get away from shore, you can dump a little bit more and a little bit more, but is it, it's just, you'd have to be 25 miles out before you could even dump anything and you still cannot dump plastic. It's always considered illegal to dump plastic in, in the ocean, even out in the deepest part of the ocean. So uh, plastic is really the worst offender. Um, all the other things that are man-made shouldn't go over either. Um, 
So uh, ways to minimize that um, when you're packing your cooler, when you're planning your trip, when you're you know getting ready to go. Uh, if you have a family or if you just have a group of friends, you know you can get a set of nice water bottles. They're all colored. Everybody has their own one. Fill them up before you leave. Um, the rule on my boat is I provide beverages that are not water. If you want a water, bring in your own bottle because we're usually only going out for a few hours and, uh, and that's sufficient. If I was going for a longer trip, I might consider it. That'd be, that'd be a different scenario. But for short little day trips, everybody bring your own water bottle. And if we have a picnic, everything is in something that is reusable. Um, it may be a silicone or plastic. And then we always try to get cans when we can rather than plastic bottles of soda or soft drinks or, or adult beverages too. But we always uh, stay away from the, the plastic as much as we can. So the last part four of this topic, as I say, every conversation goes there sooner or later, is the vessel sewage department. Um, I hate to talk about this if anybody hasn't eaten their dinner already, my goodness. Um, but this is sort of um, one of those things that always comes up. Um, so we'll go into it. And um, sewage from a boat is, you know, untreated sewage can certainly spread disease to swimmers or anybody who's in the water. So gosh, that would be the worst nightmare. You're anchored out having a good weekend swimming over the side and, you know, somebody does a flush. Uh, it can also hurt, uh, it can contaminate shellfish beds. Uh, and then somebody eats that and they get sick and it impacts water quality. So if there's sewage going into the water, it will deplete the oxygen there, which harms whatever critters are living, living there, the fish and every crabs and everybody need that oxygen. And then it has extra nutrients in it, which will lead to algal blooms, which you may know also rob the water of oxygen once they start dying off. So it's a bad cycle all the way around, which is why of course there's been a law for many years that you cannot discharge raw sewage into the waters of the United States. Um, the law actually states that you cannot discharge this raw sewage within three miles of the US coast. Um, and there's state law that duplicates um, everything. And it also, Federal Law Clean Water Act basically says uh, that, you know, all these vessels must have any, well, a vessel with an installed toilet must have a marine sanitation device. There's no rule that says you have to have an installed toilet, but if you do, you have to have a uh, marine sanitation device, as I'm sure many of you know, there's three types of these devices. Um, two types treat it and one type holds it. So I will give a quick run through here. Um, this may be more than you ever wanted to know about MSDs, but this is what you wanted me to cover was everything. So here you go. Uh, the type one MSDs um, macerate the waste and disinfect it. Uh, coliform count cannot be greater than 1,000 per 100 milliliters. And these can only be used on boats up to 65 feet in length. These need to have a US Coast Guard certification label attached or affixed by the manufacturer. So when it's purchased and installed, there should be a label clearly affixed that says it is um, certified by Coast Guard to meet these standards. And type two is very similar, uh, but it has a higher, much higher treatment um, requirement, and that says the fecal coliform bacterial count will not be greater than 200 parts per 100 milliliters. So the first one is 1,000 per 100, and the second one is 200. Maybe I got, yeah, 100, ugh, very difficult to read that all, 200 per 100 milliliters. So, um, and they also address uh, the visible solids, total solids. And this one is total suspended solids. In the type one, it says no visible floating solids, which you may not be able to see something that's pretty small, but the type two MSD is much more clear about that. Um, these types usually require more energy and are larger, but they can be used on boats of any size up to and including you know, your cruise ships, your tankers, your commercial uh, ships that you see. Um, going up and down the bay. And they also have to have a, a label affixed. Um, they are, whoops, excuse me, move on here. 
These um, systems are common. One of the most common names is electrosan, if you've heard of that or have one yourself. They're very good at um, disinfecting the waste. They uh, use electrolysis and salt water and they, you know, can sanitize the waste, but they don't really address nutrients in the waste, the phosphorus and the nitrogen that come out as a result. And there's not a lot in each little flush, but um, they don't address that. They have to have that uh, certification label, as I said, um, and they definitely require uh, maintenance. And if they're not properly maintained, then they're not gonna work to the standards they were uh, built to. So it's important if you own and operate one of these to know uh, to retain the booklet that comes with it and, and do the proper maintenance on it. Um, and these cannot be used uh, in what are called no discharge zones. And I will talk more about that in a minute, uh, but these are best used out in open waters and, you know, like where there's good flushing, but not in a marina, you know, not where there's an anchorage, that kind of thing. So the type three is the most common. That's the holding tank that most people are, are familiar with, holds the waste, doesn't treat it, doesn't release it. You go to a pump out at a marina somewhere and they pump you out literally. And that is sent to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, these may also include composting toilets or incinerating toilets. Um, but the uh, type three is the most simple and basic. That's what comes with most new boats um, built. It's simpler for the average operator to, to handle. So no discharge zones, what are they? Where are they? Um, if you're not familiar with this term, it's an area of water where no MSD can be discharged, including the type one and two treatment release. Uh, as I said before, it's already illegal to discharge raw sewage anywhere. So the type threes are never permitted to be discharged within three miles of the coastline. Now, if you're three miles offshore, you could discharge raw sewage. Uh, but inside of there, and certainly anywhere on the bay or its tributaries, that's not an option. So even if you have a treat and release, um, you can't use them in certain no discharge zones. Most commonly, this, a state uh, will seek that designation uh, when they feel their waters or a certain area of water requires extra protection um, from these nutrients. Uh, and in order to get that um, done, the state petitions to the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, who then has a magic formula, and they determine if there are enough pump outs in that area for the number of boats in that area. And Maryland does have several no discharge zones. Um, the first one here I'll show you is in the Northern Coastal Bays uh, behind Ocean City. Um, that was, I think goes back over 20 years now. And that's a pretty easy one because down there you have a lot of offshore, offshore fishing boats. So if anybody really needed to, they can go out offshore and, and use the facilities. They're fine until they come back, then they, they can, um, get a pump out if they need it or they just don't use it. Uh, the next one we have is on the Upper Eastern Shore, the Chester River and all of its tributaries. Uh, again, these waters are very uh, heavily polluted for um, nutrients and have a high population of boaters uh, and boating activity. Um, this Chester River runs from about Rock Hall in the north down to Love Point in the south. Uh, across the entrance of um, Chester River and covers all the way, all the waters eastward of that line, including um, the tributaries of the river. And this is the newest and most recent one is the waters you see here pretty much in Anne Arundel County um, up until this only Herring Bay in the southern portion of the county was a no discharge zone. Um, we are adding the remaining water bodies uh, through action uh, that will take effect this July. Um, and these other water bodies will also be no discharge zones. So a lot of people wonder, you know, what do I do? How do I comply? Uh, the most common misconception is that you have to remove your type one or two system. Um, and that is not the case. You can still have the, the system. You just can't use the system. And so you can disable access to it. Um, if you have a door on the head, you can just lock the door and that's considered disabling it. 
Coast Guard also says that dis disabling the seacock is considered um, disabling it. Um, type one and twos don't have to be removed, as I said. You can use those anywhere outside. So again, even some of those rivers in Ann Arbor County, you could just go outside the mouth of the river and use it. It's once you're in the river, you're not supposed to be using it. Um, we ask that, you know, certainly some people have room for both systems, um, a treat and release and a holding tank. So maybe you have one head connected to one and the other heads connected to another, but you use pump out stations. Our uh, DNR webpage has a complete listing of um, the pump outs in the state of Maryland, um, right there at that address you see on your screen. Um, and I was gonna make a side note um, that we fund we use federal and state money and we fund grants to marinas to install these pump outs and we have over 340 pump out stations in the state that have been funded through these grants um, that voters actually pay for. So it's a good system and Maryland is unique. We have a law that was passed in the early 90s, I forget when exactly, but that says if the marina has more than 50 slips, it needs to have a pump out station. So that's why we have so many pump out stations and it's, it's worked out well. So when, uh, when somebody is, especially in a no discharge zone, but anywhere you can report, if you find an inoperable pump out or you have a problem with one, just let us know. Uh, as I said, there's 340 of them out there and there's only two of us. And so um, please let us know. This is the email and phone number where you can report um, broken pump outs or inoperable. And then if there's a no discharge zone violation that you suspect or you witness, you can certainly notify the Department of the Environment. Um, they are the agency responsible for enforcement of um, no discharge zones. That does, that's not my agency. I Wrapping it up here, since we covered just about everything, um, I just wanted to, um, I guess, say, you know, as I stated at the beginning, we do have a potential for pollution from all of our boating activities. So um, I appreciate you guys taking time to, to put this topic in front of your, your membership and share it. And so you've, you've gotten a good overview today of the uh, boating laws. Uh, I would encourage you to know them and share them and encourage other boaters to do the same thing. And our webpage, uh, I'll show you in a second, has loads of uh, resources that I'd be glad to point you to. Um, but we can do a little bit at the front end to prevent this pollution and it'll go a long way towards helping our waterways. So that is all I have for you at the moment. Uh, here's our webpage, the dnr.maryland.gov slash boating. And on that boating page is everything you could probably ever need, <laughs> but um, there's in fact almost too much. So you may find that there's so much you don't know where to go. So if that's the case, there's my email as well. And you can always shoot me an email and say, hey, you told me about such and such and I, I can't remember, but and I'll help you find the information. But um, that's about it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. All right. All right. Well, Donna, that was uh, excellent. Um, I did have a question. You know how you talked about if you have, let's say for you, you come down to your boat and it's all full of in the bilge, maybe an older boat and there's mystery water in there. It can't go over the side. Uh, and then you, as you said, if, if you don't really know what's in there, it's good. It, it's tough to get it picked up. So um, I don't know, what, what do you consider, what is considered mystery? Is that a mystery if something in that scenario, maybe you, your engine busted um, a hose and now you've got oil in there, but it's also water and maybe mm -hmm. there's a little something else leaked in there. Mm -hmm. what, yeah, what if do it's- What um, think on that? Yeah, I've had that happen, yeah. And so I talked to the boat yard, first of all, and asked them what they want me to do with it. Um, and I can tell you what they told me, but you know, I knew in my case that I had a, an oil leak chronic situation. And so this oil, it was, it was just oil and water. And luckily oil and water are really easy to separate, right? They don't get together. So what the best thing you can do is, is, you know, pump it off into, you know, you can use a thirsty nade if it's a little bit or, you know, however you need to get it out. Um, there are some pumps, mechanical pumps too, but put it into a container and wait, 
a little bit if you can, if you're not in a you know, crisis situation, let it separate. You can mop up, you can skim the oil off and put that in an oil recycling tank and use pads to clean whatever's left. And then that water I put down the drain. Um, uh, and, okay. you know. That's a good tip. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, but of course it depends how much, you know. Yeah. Okay, and then I had another question. You know how the there are points in the Chesapeake. It's uh, what maybe it could you could get to a place uh, where it might you might be three miles away from land, and people might be tempted to open the old through hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is definitely illegal in the Chesapeake, correct? Yes, you are still in U.S. territorial waters. You need to be offshore, like off the coast of the U.S., not off of you know, Calvert Cliffs or something. Yeah. Okay, good. Just want to make that look clear. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and let's see, I I know you spoke a little bit to, uh, to, to why is it so important to use pump outs? Um, if somebody wanted, say, I, I assume I wanted some more like studies, um, more, data on the, the havoc it causes on marine life or the the multitude of reasons why we need to be so careful with pump outs. So is, is that something we can find on your website? I just feel like it's something that people have a hard time being convinced that it's mm. that. Well, hard. I know that, you know, when we have um, worked on no discharge zones, um, there is a lot of study that goes into that. And um, you could look at um, not just, we use data that already existed um, for the Anne Arundel County one. And I would say that it's not hard to look at um, impairments for the Bay waterways. And every one of those waterways is impaired for nutrients, sediments, phosphorus, and bacteria, every one of them. And I mean, grossly, horribly over polluted with those um, contaminants. So, um, and even the, you know, I'm a big proponent of choice and using, having options, um, but even the, the type one and two, they macerate that waste and it goes over. So you still have total suspended solids that block light and help make it harder for the grass to grow, make it, which is the lifeblood of everything that's living down there. Um, and the nutrients, we don't need any more nutrients at all. We're good. <laughs> We're, you know, we've got way too many nutrients. In fact, you know, we've got red tide right now down here in Annapolis. And, you know, that's some of the reasons why you get that. Some of it's naturally occurring, of course. Um, but when you think about going over, I mean, if you had to swim for fun or just to fix something, I don't want to, you know, I don't like thinking somebody is discharging you know it's just not good when there's a big congregation now out in the middle of the main stem of the bay those treat and release systems are still okay um, that's fine but when you get in some of these tight areas where there's poor flushing it's just not a good idea and it's bad for our own health I mean if you get splashed by that or anything you had to go in you can get really sick right right um, all right, I'm just noticing some comments are up here. I'm going to help read them. It's uh, Han says, glad you're including balloons as no plastic. They can be found way out at sea. I've pulled them out of my intake through the hole. Ugh. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that, Hans. I've um, it's so easy to walk down the beach and find them, and then you and you see people will have parties and they just release them right down the chest. I remember one time we picked up about four in a day. Mm. It's crazy. Well, if anyone isn't aware there, they, the state legislature did pass a bill this past session that now has made it illegal okay, to intentionally release balloons. It won't stop somebody who's really bent on doing it, but um, at least there's something. Right, right. All right, then uh, Davis Jones says, uh, it looks like the Davis Instruments bottle for catching spills through the vent is no longer made. Oh, bummer. Oh, but there, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there are other inline fuel air yeah. separators that get good reviews. Mm -hmm. Raycor makes one. Yeah, right. Raycor makes them. They make one for diesel, one for gas. They are retrofit on the vent line from your mm -hmm. inboard fuel tank. And they're really good. They work well. That's so interesting, you know, and then I'm on so many different boats. I'm <coughs> wondering if there's a suggestion for one that it could be universal. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. has any answer to that. But. 
No, all the vent lines are going to be different sizes mm. based on the size of the tank and diesel's bigger than fuel, than gasoline because the vapors are different and so forth. But the the no spills were good because you I didn't realize you couldn't get those. But um, if not, I would always say keep a pad close at hand if you know that that always is a chronic problem. They make pillows and pads and things. You could just have have somebody. Yeah, you know, stick it right all on. the boats should be stocked with them. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, Priscilla says plastic rings around six pack soda cans. Any any proposed legislation? Have you heard anything on that? I have not. No, I haven't heard anything on that. Although I have noticed um, firsthand, uh, some of the micro brewers are using lots of different uh, materials now to get away from that plastic, where they're using something that's more rigid and and recyclable uh, or compostable. So kind of some neat changes there, but uh, I know the like sodas and things that you buy all come with rip stops on them now, which is nice, uh, but no legislation that I know of. On that point though, there has been some exciting legislation that came through was it was just last year. I think in Virginia as well, we finally got the plastic bag tax. We finally got styrofoam, although it takes mm -hmm. well for these things to happen. Yeah. And then the balloons. Yeah, and Maryland now has a styrofoam ban, basically, for yeah. most products, not all. But. Yeah, so the right direction, but it just, uh, I think we all need to be remotivated every year because. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all get complacent and we get busy. I mean, the same goes with straws and all that stuff. You know, you can hear a hot button issue for a while, but then if it's not carried out, you, you think it's oh, okay, you know not a big deal anymore, but it is a big deal. And so I think that was that straw campaign was a good example of something really simple that everybody could understand. And it's really not something you need. So easy thing to give up, right? Exactly, exactly. Right, right. All right. Uh, <laughs> my lighting here is going away. Sunsets. So <laughs> <laughs> do we need um, to do colors or? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, All right, that might be the end of oh, my I questions. See, I see um, one in there. Any thought in Maryland of biodegradable plastic bags? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if what the meaning of that is exactly. I, I can I can tell you, um, Norway a few years well, quite a few years ago, supplied biodegradable plastic bags like we see in the supermarket. I had something in a locker wrapped in that bag for protection. Two years later, I took it out of the locker. It was all little pieces. Oh. So you have little pieces of plastic. Yeah. You don't have the other disposal issue and the danger issue of uh, getting caught around marine life, et cetera, mm -hmm. or hanging up in trees or getting sucked into your uh, water <laughs> intake. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's the problem with plastics. In a nutshell, they don't break down. They break up. They break yeah. into little pieces yeah. and little pieces are a lot harder to clean up than big right. pieces. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I just recycle the heck out of them. Uh, I've noted there are studies that would show if you have a bag, there's places where they're outright banned plastic bags. And then what you see is a huge uptick in the purchase of plastic trash bags in the grocery store <laughs> because everybody uses those little bags in the trash cans at home. So yeah, they have a use, but not letting them loose in the environment is a good thing. Right. Well, exactly. canvas boat bags are a lot better than plastic store bags. So there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And Donna, I was just wondering, maybe you could say a few words for all the on um, the initiatives, the like the marina program. Do you see that going well? I have here at Horn Point, we have a big placard, but I just I don't know what all that is, involves and what do we see seeing marinas oh. doing? What can we how can we um sort of be a voice for marinas joining these programs? What's going on with the Clean Marina program? Oh my gosh, that's a nice question. Thank you. Um, yeah, if anybody who has a boat at a marina, uh, ask them if they're a clean marina and tell them they should be. That's the best thing you can do because um, customer demand is what drives a business, right? Um, and we, we can push them and, and tell them why they should, but 
when customers care, it matters a lot more. So I, I start with that always. But basically, our program is a certification program. It's in lieu of, you know, it's there's a carrot and a stick. We're more the carrot than the stick, okay? Uh, but we do make sure that if they need permits and plans, whatever environmental regs they have to comply with, we get them through those hurdles. Uh, a lot of boatyards, marinas, uh, anybody who sells fuel, there's so many pieces of paper they have to do, right? And so they, they oftentimes, the best of them, don't even know all of it. So we help them with that. But other than that, we ask them to do some boater education and outreach. Uh, we provide them with a lot, but they can do it however they want. Um, and uh, we ask them to do staff training, making sure people really know what to do in the event of a spill in the event of a fire, in the event of an overdue boater, um, things that will really impact um, the operations and risk of a serious situation at that marina. Um, and we definitely ask them to get involved in the management level of the marina, that they know what's going on and they know that they have clear, concise rules for everybody that's there, be it a contractor coming in, uh, or if you store your land ashore, what are the rules? What are your rules in the water? What can go in? What cannot go in? And that includes discharges from the boats, soaps that you use on the boats, you know, just education and outreach, but also letting the boaters know what these laws are. Like I was explaining tonight, there are laws that impact the boat owner, not the marina. You know, when that discharge comes from a boat, it's not the marina's fault. So, you know, we ask them to do that boater outreach and then have some strong, clear rules and, um, and know, like, if a contractor comes in and they generate hazardous waste, the contractor generally has to take that with them. But if they accept it, um, some yards do, you know, then having an appropriate way to uh, control it so that it's not just open to the public, it's not messy, it's not getting loose into the environment. So there are a lot of different things, um, but even the simplest places can be in the program. So um, we have little community association marinas that are uh, certified clean marina partners. And what they do is focus just on their own waste, right? How can they reduce some waste that they are generating and, um, and then do their boater education, have some emergency preparations. And um, we ask them all to look at their stormwater runoff so everybody has those things in common. And uh, no, it's going, it's been going well. Um, we have certified and remain certified at about 25% of the marinas in Maryland uh, that have that designation. Um, we would love there to be more, you know, uh, but it certainly uh, is a factor of um, staff being consistent year to year. We go back every three years and recertify these facilities. So in a lot of cases, we're still just getting them to stay in the program is, is um, a good bit of work too. Okay. And do, do you have a sister organization in Virginia? We do. Uh, they, all, they also have a Clean Vessel Act program, which is the pump out grants. And they definitely are in the process of refilling their clean marina coordination position. And that's through DNR? Uh, Department of Health, I think. Department of Health, okay. All right. All right, well, that was spectacular. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. Yeah, I, uh, attention. Oh, yeah, thank Yeah, definitely. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it, and I, I love getting remotivated, and, I'm, and it's so exciting to hear these programs are alive and well, and we're putting money towards these ideas, and it's not... You know, that's um, it's really great. And now we have you as a, as a resource. We can come to and ask yeah. all our hard questions. So yeah, you know, if I don't know, I'll, I'll dig around until I find the answer for you. <laughs> you might not like the answer, but I'll try to find one for you. All right. Well, just as long as we're all working on it. Yeah. <laughs> Donna, thank you so much um, for such an informative and terrific presentation. And Yvonne, for your great moderating as always. Um, <laughs> next month, we're back to the fourth uh, Monday in the month and we look forward um, to seeing you all again next month so enjoy your boating the weather hopefully will um, improve a bit uh, given all these storms recently and um, we can all get the, out there and enjoy the water so thank you all um, appreciate it all right. thank you have a good night